Kui, welcome. Welcome everyone to the fourth public lecture in this series on HIV, From Cell to Society, the 13th Annual President's Dream Colloquium, which I can't say properly, at SFU. Thank you all for coming. Um, my GST name is Valerie Nicholson. Uh, the name given to me four days after my birth was the one the Eagles watch over. I've been gifted a Dene name, uh, Nodiwenda, which means wolf eyes. And recently, from the Torres Strait in Australia, I was gifted the name Auntie. I am Mi'kmaq, and I'm living with HIV. And I'll also be your MC for tonight. And they wrote MC because they didn't want me saying Mistress of Ceremonies. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to acknowledge that we're here today on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of all the Coast Salish people around this beautiful Coast Salish Sea. The videos that you saw playing on the screen while you entered were created by youth from the Yosemite program at YouthCo and submitted to the Real Youth Film Festival where two of them have won awards. The Real Youth Film Festival empowers young artists to be a model for community engagement and is a celebration for youth culture. For, for, for more information, please visit realyouth.ca or YouthCo, or see all our videos on YouTube, and the youth will be gathering again at the end of March and producing some more videos. So before we begin, I would like to thank the members of the SFU and SFU Research Center for HIV for their work and for hosting such an event tonight. They've done an amazing job and a lot of hard work, so thank you. The speakers tonight are Indigenous women. To me, they're warriors. They're activists, they're elders, and they're scientists. They will be discussing the importance of cultural safety in the Canadian healthcare system, particularly for Indigenous peoples affected by and living with HIV. These speakers are part of a movement seeking to redefine the way that healthcare engages with Indigenous peoples and finds an innovative ways to share knowledge, create change, and move towards culturally safe healthcare. We will finish the event with a panel, including all of our speakers from this evening, and open up to questions from you. We want to make this really interactive. So now it is my honor and pleasure to introduce my new good friend, or good friend, an amazing woman, Elder Glida and her daughter Jade, to open up tonight's event. Good evening, everyone. It's such an honor to be here and to open tonight. And my name's Glida Morgan from the Sla'ama Nation, and that's Paul River. And those are a few here that might know where that is. My mother was born there right on the land in Sla'ama, and I have great memories of my home. I currently live in the city, and I'm just... Uh, so honored to be here, and I just want to acknowledge again the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh for allowing us to have our beautiful evening on their unceded territory. Emote, introduce, get Jade to introduce herself. Hi, I'm so honored to be in front of such a beautiful, beautiful audience and I'm honored that to share my little teachings that I have along my way and I've strived to be in my wellness ever since I was young. I've been through the dark paths and of drugs and alcohol and partying and all that stuff that everybody once did or thought of or anything, right? Like 
And I just know that if you have, like the creator says, our higher God, our higher power, like uh, if when God closes a door, he opens a window. And I feel that there's always a way to heal through art or through music or through poetry or anything. I think it's a blessing that we have our life, that we have a shelter, our food, or anything. Just pick out anything that you're grateful for. Or, uh, and I'm just grateful for all the cultures here that are united as one. And I just want to say that as the eagle soars, I am flying with you through the sky and uh, looking down upon Mother Earth and observing its beauty like the roses, how rich in beauty the red of the rose can be, and like the beautiful daisies and sunflowers, and even simple as, uh, I don't even know, daffodils? <laughs> I'm just thinking of anything, you know, spontaneously. I didn't really prepare, I'm sorry. But I just want to say I'm honored to be here at, amongst beautiful people, and. My name is Jade Rochelle Morgan, and my native name is Ians, which means leaf. And I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can introduce yourself. Hi, Hi, OCM, OCM. I, I. Greetings and welcome everyone. As Co Salish Matriarch and Elder, I wish to give warm thanks to all my relatives in the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh for welcoming me to live in the unceded lands of my relatives in Richmond, the Musqueam, for 40 years now. As Co Salish Matriarch and Elder, I wish to give each and every one of you a warm welcome who live, work, and play and visit in our unceded, ancestral, and occupied lands of my relatives, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Thank you, Elder Glyde and Jade, for welcoming me up to, to share a welcome with you. And um, we have another beautiful elder who does many, many circles, Elder Mar, and she taught us this uh, song called the Thank You Grandmother's Song. And when she first told me she was gonna teach me, I said, I can't sing. And I had a horrible experience in a choir as a child, and I never sang for over 55 years. And Elder Mar said, oh, yeah, you will. And guess what? Elder Roberta is singing now. <laughs> so we're going to uh, sing the Thank You Grandmother song. So we uh, please join us, if you wish. Uh, clap your hands as we sing the verse. And uh, we sing it four times yeah. to, for the four directions. It's welcome. want to share a little bit of the teachings from my elders and um, do you want to just stay there Jade and Glida and uh, can you come up come up Rebecca up here
And as I teach out there many times that uh, what my elders taught me when you're asking them to come and do something or share a cultural teaching or share a story or share their knowledge is what you do is you give them a gift. It could be a gift of anything, but it also could be a gift of the sacred plants. So our beautiful Indigenous team at St. Paul's Hospital that I work with, Neil, Rebecca, Levita, and Rose, um, we got together and we created some sacred plants. So I'll give one each to you, uh, Jade, and um, Clyda. And um, if uh, we'd like to offer, offer this to, um, to Dr. Kerry Barasa, uh, Rebecca, if you could take it out and and offer this to you and welcome you to the Coast Salish Territory and ask for you to speak in our territory and share your gifts with us. So haifka, haifka, siam. Thank you. And uh, Danita, can you come up and maybe that over that way, Danita? That's okay, my dear. So I just want to share that this bundle that we're offering up is uh, cedar, sage, sweetgrass, and tobacco. Uh, and we're uh, giving the sacred plants of the, the nations. Thank you, Danita. Thank you for welcome to our territory and for speaking and sharing your gifts on our, ter on our traditional Coast Salish territory. And Dr. King, Alexandra, where are you? Can you come up, my dear? And So, Dr. Alexandra King, uh, we uh, offer this gift, sacred gift to you to welcome you to speak and share your gifts on the Coast Salish Territory. Haichka, haichka siam. Thank you. And our dearest Elder Betty, if you could come up. We saved the best for last. <laughs> welcome you to our Coast Territory to share your, your teachings and share your gifts with us tonight. And as your elder, um, I've given you special uh, tobacco as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful offerings and the wonderful opening and just bringing us all to be grounded on this territory. Uh, thank you so much. Tonight we have four incredible Indigenous warrior women speaking to their experiences on the topic of HIV and Indigenous communities in Canada. It is my pleasure and honour to introduce the first speaker for tonight. Danita is from the Sakame First Nation in Treaty 4 territory. She is a co-facilitator of the AIDS program for South Saskatchewan, a peer mentor with Re, uh, Regina Kuapel, Kuapel, please excuse my pronunciations for tonight, Health Region. She's a member and our former board member of the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network. She's the chair of Voices of Women, VOW, and a board member of the International Community of Women Living with HIV. It is my honour and pleasure to bring up Danita. Tansi. Uh, my name is Danita Wapuzia. My spirit name is uh, Lightning Rock Woman and calls for a woman. I'm 53 years old. Um, I'm half Soto and half Cree. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> can you be 
Bude sa pet. Ja, Um, yeah, this is my first time doing a PowerPoint, um, so I'm hoping it's okay. <laughs> okay, so I've been living with HIV for the past 14 years. I was diagnosed in, diagnosed in 2005. Um, I have two children, and I have um, nine grandchildren at home. Um, I lost a, a child 23 years ago. And um, I guess that was my first loss that I felt in my life. I also lost her to her father. Um, three, they were three months apart that, uh, when I lost them. Um, I grew up on, uh, on my dad's reserve um, on Sacme First Nation. I was born in a, in a small town hospital um, in Melville, Melville, Saskatchewan. I and my brother, younger brother, um, I lived out on the reserve for uh, around till about two years old. Um, before, while I was a baby, um, my parents had lost uh, two two sons. Um, I don't think I've met them. I, I was too too young to remember. And um, one, while I was growing up, um, after the age of two, my parents and I. And our family, we did a lot of traveling. Um, we, tra we lived in Edmonton, we lived in Lethbridge, we li also lived in Calgary. And then we came back to Regina. And um, I remember, um, well, I was around six years old when um, my, my dad started drinking. And um, it was at this time that um, our family was broken, broken apart. Um, we were put in social services and um, until I was, it was permanent award and my two younger sister, my younger brother and my younger sister, they were illegally adopted and I didn't meet them until when I was in, well, almost 20, I think. But uh, yeah, so, and then I had a, I have an older sister and she was uh, a runaway, but she was, uh, no foster home could keep her. Um, so she was on her own at quite a young age. Um, um, HIV affects my family um, in my community. Um, I lost five family members, um, cousins that, to HIV. I just most recently lost a sister. Um, the one sister that I was growing up with in the foster home um, about 18 months ago and that still affects me today but um, also I've, I lost, she lost her, her daughter about five years ago, um, my niece to HIV and um, when I think about it right now it's you know those deaths in, in my community and in, in my family um, they shouldn't have happened you know um, but then there's reasons why, you know, why it happened and I'm just starting to understand it now. Uh, so, I'm just reading from my notes here because I have a hard time remembering. Um, I think we can click it, the introduction. I was able to get, uh, this is my grandparents on my dad's side, my Kokum Ruby Wapuzian and Edward Wapuzian. Um, my grandfather, my Mosham, was a medicine man on Sakme. And um, they were very spiritual and very ceremonious people. Um, but then uh, um, with my father, um, my father doesn't know his culture to this day. My father doesn't know how to speak his language. Um, my father is a was a product of the residential school system. And um, I think to this day, like I have never heard him say anything about the school. Um, he never talks about it. So I know it really affected him to the point where he became a severe alcoholic. Um, that is one of the reasons why we, we got taken away when I was a kid. Um, he's now sober. He's been sober now for like 20, 30 years. 
Um, so talking a little bit about where I grew up, I grew up in Regina. Um, my two younger siblings were adopted. We were in a foster home up until I was around 15. Uh, me and my older sister and my brother and um, I just like to say that the foster home that I was in was not a very good home. It was very abusive um, emotionally, physically, verbally and spiritually, you know. It took a lot out of us and um, I used to have nightmares about that home when I got out. Um, and then they, they, they won the lottery. They won like three million dollars and they passed away. So, I don't know, and then after that I quit having nightmares when I knew that they weren't, they weren't alive anymore. So I put them to rest. Um, and also, while I was in the foster home, I, I did my grade 9 and 10 at Belfort Tech. And um, while I was there, they made us to change our names. Um, I was Teresa Kirkland for grade 9 and grade 10. And the same with my brother and my sister. Um, it, um, the home made me feel ashamed of being who I was. Um, my name is Ra my, my last name is Rabbit um, Wapuzian, and in Cree it means rabbit skin. And I felt very at that time I was a felt ashamed I felt ashamed of my having that name. Um, so I guess um, I could just say that I lost my identity you know way back then, who I was. And okay, so after the foster home, I was reunited with my my biological mother, and she was living out here in Abbotsford, BC. Um, she found us and we, she put us on the plane. We come and met her. We come and lived here for about a couple years. I went to high school at Abbotsford Senior High. I almost graduated, but I didn't. Um, and then her, her father passed away. And so we had to go back to Saskatchewan to uh, go to his funeral and we never did return back here. Um, I was around 16, um, well 15, I got out of the foster home when I was 15. Um, I started experimenting with drugs and alcohol when I was 16. I was raped when I was 16. I had my first child when I was 17. And um, I really didn't know how to be a parent um, at that that time of my life. But I had help. I had help from my mother and I had help from my oldest sister, Cheryl. And uh, she was never in care. Um, but anyway, so I lived, uh, I, I lived in, I had a couple of very abusive relationships in my life and um, I started dabbling in uh, alcohol a lot, a lot of, a lot of times I was taking uh, sleepers, um, Restoral, Valium, Xanax, um, I OD'd a couple of times on those. I tried to, my older cousins would uh, get me to check out uh, T's and R's, which is Tuinol and Rest, um, Redland, and um, I didn't like it, but I, uh, and, and I didn't care f to do any more of that kind of, a, thank you. I didn't care to do any more of those uh, injecting drugs. But uh, there was a time when I, uh, my sister had given me some, some sleepers and I remember falling asleep in the bathtub and I, was ODing and they had to come and kick down the bathroom door and rescue me. So I didn't do well on taking pills. Um, to this day, I don't like taking pills at all except for my HIV meds. And um, in 1995, um, I was pregnant with um, with my daughter, and I uh, I miss I had two miscarriages before her. Um, when I was um, three months before she was born, um, her dad had uh, passed away. And uh, then I lost her when she was born. Um, her cord was wrapped around her neck 
And I, th I always blamed myself and I always felt so much guilt about what happened to both of them that, you know, like, it was like, I was, I was just wanting to die all the time. I was just like, hated myself. And uh, that had a really bad uh, impact on my life, on the way I was living. So I just continued to just keep on drinking and, you know, and living in a blur. I don't remember like about 10 years of my life. I was just drinking like every day. And, um, and then um, one day, um, my daughter was around 16-ish. Um, and then her dad, her biological dad came to come visit me and I was under the influence and um, I took my first shot of cocaine with my daughter and and from there it was like I was instantly addicted to cocaine I wanted it every day I did it every day and then I con then I contracted HIV and that was but um, yeah there was a lot of there's a history about me and my daughter my daughter's been clean and sober now for about nine years and I'm very proud of her and I have nine grandchildren from her. And um, she's real, one of my biggest supports in my life right now. Um, I've been clean and sober off of cocaine for five years now. And um, yeah, I, I just, uh, she, she's an amazing woman. I just want to say that because she's, uh, there's a picture, a slide. Um, this was taken on my mom's um, birthday. On, this, on New Year's Eve this past Christmas. Chris, uh, no. This is my family. And we tried to do this an, um, an, um, an annual event for Christmas. We all tried to get together and, and eat together. And, and um, yeah. I have two older sisters in there. Oops. Uh, my brother, uh, he's in there. Um, my brother lives with me right now. Uh, he was doing not too bad, not too good. I mean, in Saskatoon, he was uh, drinking every day um, for the past two years. And about probably around three months ago, I went and got him from Saskatoon. And he's been sober ever since. So I just uh, wanted to like say that because um, I know when you have family support, um, anything can happen, right? Uh, okay, so this next slide. Um, this is uh, my role as a peer mentor and support person. Um, I became involved with the uh, APSS um, when I was first diagnosed. Um, my, f my first peer mentor was uh, a woman by the name of Lydia Thompson. She was the client service um, manager, I guess, coordinator. And she had a life skills program that I, she offered to, for, for me to um, begin, um, be involved in. And in that program, um, she wanted to know, I, I wanted to uh, get some help for my addiction. Um, and so I went to my first treatment center and it was a healing lodge. And that's when I first got my, my first spirit name in that lodge. And um, once I well, once I completed rehab, um, I was trained and I was hired full time by H by Christine Smith, who was the um, the ED of Ops. And um, I'm really grateful for her to her because um, she was the first person that that really believed in me and. Um, you know, she was kept on encouraging me to get my son home from social services, and and I really, really tried hard um, in working on myself <clears throat> during that time that I was working there. I worked there from 2006 to 2012. I was the needle exchange coordinator, and I was a high functioning ad addict too. Um, I would go to work 8:30, get off work. Uh, weekends, I would dabble in my coke and then go back to work for the whole week. And that continued for a while until 
December of 2012, I, I hit my rock bottom. Um, I lost my son, per, it, so, so it's like permanent, permanent ward or long term, my son. In, in that time, uh, he also, did, as a little boy, he didn't want to see, see me anymore. Um, I lost my part, partner, our relationship, this, this was um, gone. Uh, I lost my job, he lost his job. We both got evicted in the house that we were renting from all in one month. And then, um, so that was a very emotional time in my life. And that December, um, I decided to run away and I ran away to Saskatoon. I thought that Regina was not not the place for me anymore. So I stayed in Saskatoon for about, about a year or so. And I was, um, I got involved with uh, my first female relationship and it was a love and hate relationship um, but something I can say good about her is that she got me off cocaine um, she had a tight leash on me but um, I didn't like that that control and uh, I missed my my family my my people in Regina so I made a made a um, commitment to come back to Regina. And while I was up in Saskatoon, uh, I still continued to do my drug screens and did my urine screens and then uh, I did them three times a week and really, really trying to get this coke out of my system and I wasn't using for the longest time. And then I came back to Regina and I got, got back with the, seeing uh, my, the social worker for my son and, and then all of a sudden they, uh, I, oh yeah, then I, before, then, oh yeah, I went to my last, my fourth treatment center at Calder. And, uh, and that was the time in my life that I, I had issues in my life that I really, really wanted to get, um, I wanted to work on. Um, I had to forgive my parents. I had to forgive, um, I had to forgive myself too because of catching HIV, you know, the, the hate, the self-hate that I had. I had to get rid of all that and I, I really, didn't want to die, you know. Um, I used to think that I only had like less than 10 years to live. And every time I thought about it, you know, I just hated myself. And why did I put myself in this, in this um, predicament, right? <clears throat> but now today, it's a, today is a different story. Um, I, don't, I don't want to die. I just want to keep living. <laughs> and um, I think the next, oh, okay. I have a lot of support. This, um, this is one of my friends here. His name is Knighton Hillstrom. He's, uh, he sits on the board of CAN, and he's a uh, good support to me. Um, okay, I'm just getting all mixed up here. Okay, um, so anyways, um, I got my son home, and um, he's been home now for five years, but... Um, and I still continue to, my focus is on him and me. Um, no other in, outside, I have been like without a relationship for all that time and all this time. And um, being a peer mentor is really giving me a lot of uh, hope and a lot of um, purpose that I live for every day. And um, while being a peer mentor, you know, it's taught me um, to open my eyes up um, and also sitting on the board of CAN, you know, I've been doing a lot of traveling, um, doing training and, you know, seeing how, what it's HIV across from one end of the country to the other country, the other side of the country, and getting to know the issues that we face. And with some of the stuff that I've learned is that um, I see a lot of discrimination and I see a lot of stigma and a lot of racism, especially in my, where I come from in Saskatchewan. Um, I see a lot of brokenness in my community. Um, I, I grew up in North Central and that was deemed like the worst neighborhood in, in, in Canada while well, I lived there. And um, growing up there, you know, it, now there's so many gangs and stuff there. It's, it makes it hard for a person just to walk down the street without getting jumped or robbed, you know. And that, I see all that brokenness in my community, and you know, and I want my 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 community to get to get healthier. 
but there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen to that I, I realize and it's not just um, the, it's the whole community needs to come together for that and I realized that you know those same broken people that I know that those are that's who I was I was a broken person just like them and I can see you know why they're they're like that because I was like that and I know why I self-medicated and I know why I did this and that and put myself at a high risk the lifestyle that I was living um, and I realized that grief sometimes turns ill in our bodies and sometimes our bodies just give up the will to live and that happened in my family with my sister and she was too so much in pain that she didn't want to live anymore I know that we have a contaminated contaminated drug supply coming in um, in 2016 there was 82 deaths in, our, in Saskatchewan because of the opiate poisoning um, I see eight Saskatoon is going to open up a safe injection site. I hope Regina does that too. Uh, in, as a peer mentor, I really encourage that people get tested and people get on treatment and people adhere to treatment. I see a lot of people not getting wanting to be tested because of the stigma. I've heard of stories of got people telling me that if they get tested and they they find out they're positive that they're gonna kill themselves I try not to be judgmental in my work and I really believe that we need more culturally informed services in the province but um, I give credit to all nations hope because they're really doing amazing work in Regina the next slide um, this is my pick of I did a body map I was in a, a, a HIV retreat and it was came from the watch study and it shows it's a big full-size body map I wish I had it in real life here to show you guys I just love it um, it shows in the reason the, how and why I got infected with HIV there were so so many systems um, that even growing up that um, that failed me um, and um, but I have a lot of support too and there's places that I want to go you know I want to I want to go to university and I want to become <coughs> an addiction um, in mental health or some in the health field like I have hopes um, to getting a, another good job and in the community um, but first and foremost, I like, I like doing my work. I like being a peer mentor. Um, just to talk about um, a little bit about uh, healthcare violence I, that I see in my community. Um, I see a lot of people who are sick. Um, they get infections. And then when they go to the hospital, and I'm, like, I'm one of them because I had, I had a couple of um, serious infections, which I almost died. And I wasn't treated very nicely. Um, I was treated um, like sort of like garbage by the nurses and the staff. And um, this one time when I had a gallbladder issue, um, I kept on, it kept, I kept on having to go to, to the hospital because I was in severe pain. And um, they they couldn't find no veins uh, because my all my veins are collapsed. Um, they couldn't they wanted to do put a needle in my foot and I refused and then they say well take the pill and I took it and I threw up and that's what you do when you're having a gall, gallbladder attack right you, you throw you're throwing up so I ended up leaving the hospital and coming back again not very long after in the ambulance and I was still more in pain so I know how I was treated and I complained to the general hospital and it took them about a month or two, but um, they did a review, and then I was able to get a, an apology. So I was able to advocate for myself, and then I think that's when I started knowing that I can use my voice, and I can speak up for myself, whereas before I wasn't able to do that. And um, uh, 
I know the roots of HIV, HIV is a direct result of the impact of colonization and the residential school system. Saskatchewan is very much a racist province. There was a time not long ago, okay, I already said this. <laughs> okay, there, there was a time when I was in a hospital another time, and um, I had a very old, elderly, Caucasian white lady, right? She was my roommate. And then every time she would see me, she would look at me and scream and say, help, help, help. Um, there's an Indian in my room. And she kept on saying that and screaming, and it really made me feel really, I felt so much anger towards her, you know, to she, how she made me feel and how she acted. Um, there's health disparities that can be connected to the lack of, to the lack of po political acknowledgement and political will. That's when the funding cuts, it affects everyone in communities. And HIV, it hasn't decreased, it's increased in Saskatchewan. Um, doors are being shut down, services are gone for those who really need it. I see how social injustice systems are failing Indigenous people. Far too many children are taken and parents are jumping through hoops, um, yet they don't help these children get back to their home, their rightful parents. Um, and that, that was an incident with my daughter, you know, social services were going to take her kids away permanently and adopt them out. My daughter went into a year-long treatment center and she was able to get her kids back. And then the rest is history. She's so good now. But anyway, some parents lose hope and the parents give up. And then there is also far too many people, men and, and women, incarcerated. Um, I had to speak up one time for my mentee when she was going to court and um, the judge was wanting to give her six months and I stood there and advocated for her for like 15 minutes and telling him the reasons why I don't think that she should go to jail. I think that she needed other kinds of help out in the community and I was able to help her. Link, I was able to help her link up to all these different services and um, well, needless to say, she wasn't given a, a sentence. She was released. And I think, I think sometimes we just need to be that helping hand and that, um, that helping person. And sometimes miracles do happen. I was, asked to, I was asked to do a disclosure workshop for World AIDS Day um, this past year. And I know, that, um, I know that disclosing our HIV status is very difficult for a lot of positive people. <clears throat> Um, like for myself, um, for disclosure, when I was, when I first found out I was diagnosed, I told my mother that not to tell anybody. Um, the very next day, everybody in my family knew about I was HIV positive. So from then on, I just was open about my status. You know, I didn't care who knew who, what I, what I had, you know. And um, I know a lot of people don't like that. You know, they don't want people to to know that they're HIV positive, and that's their, that's their right, you know. You don't have to tell anybody who you're positive except your sexual partner. And I tell that to my mentees, and I tell that to my community. And, um, and there was a community report on um, participants, myself included. We expressed five main concerns about um, disclosure. One, we have the, the fear of going to jail. Two, we, there's negative impacts on sexual relationships. Three, there's violence against us. Four, discrimination from police, which by the way, um, there is so much police abuse re, uh, that is going on against us. Um, and number five is being targeted for being indige indigenous and HIV positive. Um, there's stories of my, of, uh, police brutality, um, where, where my dad and my brother were taken out of town and they were beaten up and they were left out there in, in, on, in the cold. It was winter time and, and they were told to walk back. And so a lot of people, indigenous people, we don't trust the police. 
Um, Human Rights Watch interviewed 64 Indigenous women between January and July 2016. It was documented that police neglect, neglect when, re when women are reporting domestic violence, inappropriate and invasive body and strip searches, sexual harassment, which I also experienced, and the physical assault, another time I, when I was beaten up by them. So, so what happens? The breakdown of trust between the Indigenous communities and law enforcement. It breeds a culture of silence for victim, and this needs to change. Next slide. Um, moving forward. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that A Saskatoon is opening up in the, their first safe injection site. Um, I also would like to see um, in the province, we have a lot, a huge meth, crystal meth problem. Um, we have um, an opioid um, overdose problem also, and we don't have the right criteria, we don't have the right rehabilitation centers in our, in our cities to handle these. So I like to see more help and getting help from outside and how, like resources wise. Um, we, need, we need to look at creating solutions, um, innovated, innovative, responsive, community-led and community-driven interventions with partnerships in both healthcare providers and the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of Canada. We need safe spaces for clients to access where they are cared for and supported unconditionally and non-judgmentally. I believe in a two-eyed seeing approach where we can use land-based approaches with Western medicine. Again, culture saves lives. Um, we, li we live in the communities, know that, we know as Indigenous people, we know what works for us. We, at one time, we lived very healthy lives before colonization. We do know how to do it. We just know, need more, need adequate resources and support and the, capacity to deliver that success. Um, nothing about us without us. I like to see more positive peers. I like to see more brown faces at organizations where we can come and be open and we need more indigenous peers at the table. So this concludes my speak. Last slide. Um, yeah, that's one more. That's it. Okay. Um, yeah, that concludes my speak. Um, I will continue to live a good life for my children and for my grandchildren. I do not, I believe I'm not a victim anymore. I believe in life. I believe I will continue to live with purpose as my creator would want me to. I pray my moccasins will gently lead the way. I will be that voice my sister and my niece didn't have. And I will continue to fight the good fight. Thank you for com coming, and it's been an honor to be here. Hi, all my relations, miigwech, hi, hi. Thank you so much, Danita, for sharing your journey with all of us. Thank you so much. It touched my heart. It touched my spirit. And I will take your words with me. Thank you. Our next two speakers will be presenting together. First will be Elder Betty McKenna. She's Anishinaabe. She's a lecturer, author, and storyteller at Regina Public Schools and First Nations University of Canada. Guiding Elder for Research and Education for Solutions to End Violence and Abuse, Resolve, in Saskatchewan. Guiding Elder, Morning Star Lodge, Regina, Saskatchewan. Joining her is Dr. Carrie Barasa. She's Métis. She is a professor of Indigenous Health, Community Health and Epidemiology in the College of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan and Scientific Director of the CIHR Institute of Indigenous Peoples Health. Let's have a warm welcome, Quay. Welcome to our turtles.
Just looking at the article, <laughs> I'm always fascinated by it. <clears throat> Before I do begin, I'd like to say <clears throat> to Danita, you know, you are the hope of Saskatchewan for our people who carry that gift of HIV/AIDS, because our people understand that when we have something new come into our communities that affect people the way HIV AIDS has affected all, all, all our people in Saskatchewan and how it's, it's gathering strength around, you know, the, the other provinces. It's not just Saskatchewan, but other places. But being able to tell people they do have a voice, they can use that voice. You tell your story, you wear that beautiful skirt that says, I've been through pain, I've been through hell and back but I'm back. That, my girl, is wonderful. And that's what you carry with you. <laughs> so this is our uh, digging deep. It's actually, this, these words are in Cree and I'm not Cree. So whoever the Cree person was that put this up here, I wish they were here to be able to say, say those words to you because I'm not. <laughs> so, digging deep, examining the root causes of HIV AIDS among Aboriginal women. And uh, I'd like to, first of all, uh, thank the, the people that welcomed us to our, to this, to, for us to speak here. And uh, with the wonderful welcome and the wonderful song, it means so much to me. The, the songs will carry us home. I know that, back onto the prairie. And I would like to also acknowledge the people that worked on this uh, project with us. And I'm not gonna go through all the names, but I would like to, uh, well, this would have, should have been first. <laughs> so welcome, uh, thank everyone in, in this territory. And these are the number of people that participated in the interviews and the surveys the service providers and the elders and knowledge keepers that were interviewed. So I guess I will, what I want to do, first of all, is I want to show you by demonstrating exactly what is digging deep. This is my tobacco. I grow it myself rather than um, go to that store, you know, and buy that stuff. So I have beautiful pink flowers on it when you, when you grow your own tobacco. But this little cloth, this little red, this is called a tobacco tie that I'm eventually going to make it into. So this little tobacco tie, do you want me to? Yeah, I'll, I'll it's cut in a square. It represents the four directions, because there's four directions on that square. This is the little tie. And when we take the tobacco, and we must think of this project of digging deep. So we begin a project for women. And women are life givers. Women have seeds. When women are born, they're born with all their seeds, all the rigs. They're uh, three generations every time a woman is born. So when we think of doing this for women, this is our intention. We are in the middle and we are that tobacco. We put that, that knowledge 
that we want in that tobacco. We ask the Creator to help us to do things that is going to help all people in that community. We place it in the middle of four directions, which means we're calling everyone from those four directions. That's our community. Those are our community people who are going to come together. We put our intention into that tobacco, and we are that intention in the middle. So we bring the four directions up, and those community members come together. They surround that knowledge. They bring that knowledge. They bless that project with their, their presence, with their commitment and their intention that's placed in the tobacco. We wrap it in ceremony. And this little tobacco tie is then burnt in the sacred fire. And those prayers from all the community members, those prayers go to the Creator so that the Creator can blanket that whole community with healing. Because when you have a disease that comes into your, your community, we must think of them as gifts. Gifts that we can learn from. We can learn strength from it. And we go to the people who have it. We go to those people. We interview those women. We talk to them. They share their stories. They say how strong they are. They say their struggles. And in the very fact that they do it, they are a gift to that whole community. And we gather those gifts and we give them a tobacco tie and thank them for giving that to us. That's what our project of dignity has done. It's to honor the gifts that are given to our communities. Honor those women. Honor those life givers who carry that. Oops. Miigwech, Um So our project, as you can see, is uh, community-based. It's driven from community. Um, All Nations Hope uh, was our partner, um, but not really. All Nations Hope drove the, drove the project. Uh, I was merely um, the servant to the community. I was able to help find funding. That's what I did. Um, Morningstar Lodge has been able to serve the community in any way that we possibly can. And we were able to provide some training. One of the training, for example, um, as much as we would provide, for example, uh, in vivo and SPSS training and privileged Indigenous methodologies, one of the training was also tobacco tie training. And not only did we gather um, all, of the, all of the community um, research researchers and the community members and our team, uh, we also brought our children and we brought everybody together. We brought community together. And in my opinion, the training um, from the tobacco ties and any, any of the other training that we did, um, that was it was training as much as, it was just as important as our in vivo training was, right? Um, to us, that's equally as important, if not more important. Um, and when uh, Kokum would have ceremony, uh, we would never force anybody, but we, we pay our staff to go to ceremony because that's, that's learning, it's teaching, it's training. And so to us, Morningstar Lodge um, is a mentorship lab and it's, it's a space where we serve community, but it's also a space where they're learning in a very different way than you might in a, in a research lab. So when people hear research lab, it's like, no, you gotta, you gotta realize this is a much different research lab than you've ever seen before. And we're very blessed to have uh, Elder Betty, who happens to also be my, my cookum, uh, lead our lab in that way. Uh, I do want to share a few important aspects of, of the work. Um, you know, what did we do? We, everything starts with ceremony. Um, and when we ran into a snag, what did we do? We went back to ceremony. We always go back to prayer. 
When we say that spirit has to be involved in research, it has to be an essential element of the research. It can't be just something that you want to throw in there. And so you heard um, Elder Betty talking about that, and, and that's, you know, it's an example of, of how we ensured um, that, that spirit was the center of the work we do. Um, we we um, in, incorporated Indigenous methodology, but not only in, in, um, in, in collecting information, um, we, we wanted it to be, um, you know, infused with spirit because these were, these were stories, you know, as Danita was speaking, these were, these were like her words. We had to be so, so careful with them. These are, these are their lives. And so even in the transcription and the training of transcription, we were imparting to, to our staff at, at Morningstar Lodge, you know, these are people's lives. These aren't just stories, right? So even when we were doing training around transcription, um, helping people to understand how, how very important these were. Um, oh, pardon me? Yes, we went through the sweat lodge first. Yeah, Elder Bay just said, remember, we went through the sweat, sweat lodge first. Like everything we did, we did through ceremony. Um, we had community-based research navigators that were uh, in community that were at All Nations Hope, for example. Um, here's some of the staff is, um, uh, that are at All Nations Hope. There's Margaret in the white shirt. Um, here's our Morning Star Lodge team. Um, we now are up to 15 staff. Uh, eight, of, eight staff are, are full-time staff. Here's some of the project details. As I said, we have indigenous methodologies, but we also, um, there's a lot of methodologies for collecting information. There's not as many indigenous methodologies for analyzing um, information and data. Um, we adapted a methodology called the uh, C uh, CCDAP. It's a, it's a methodology that was uh, Dr. Judy Bartlett. Um, if anybody knows Dr. Judy Bartlett, she's a Métis physician. She just retired and she's fantastic, one of my mentors. And it, it's a methodology where um, everybody participates, community members participate, researchers participate, but it would take a very long time. So sometimes it would take, you know, three, four days, sometimes longer, and a lot of people can't take that long to, to come together to an, analyze data. So we've been able to adapt it so that you can have it done in a day or less and still have everybody participate. And um, we did this with the permission of Dr. Bartlett. And so this is how we've been able to actually have an Indigenous methodology to analyze data, which we're um, publishing, because you have to publish if you want it to be validated on the Western side of things. Um, but we're also creating a toolkit where community will be able to use it. And, uh, and that's, I think, the most important part. So as we said, culture and ceremony have been woven throughout the project. Um, it began with ceremony. We have cer ceremony throughout it. We gave the tobacco ties to the study participants. Um, the tobacco ties were wrapped and blessed and given in a gift of thanks, as Elder Betty said. Um, we had other ceremonies, sweat lodge, water ceremony, feasts, a health bundle, um, and Elder Betty was our guiding uh, elder in all of this. So this is the CCDAP, it's a Collective Consensual Data and Analytic Procedure. We had to change that name. So we want to do that in ceremony <laughs> because that is not, not the name that you will, that you, will you know, just roll off your lips. Uh, so we definitely have to change that name, but um, we're, def we're going to do that um, as, as we, as we have to, you know, we have to do everything in ceremony. So as we have the, um, the toolkit ready, then we'll, we'll be able to, to put it through ceremony. Here's some of the, the, the sub-themes that came out of the, the findings. You know, recommendations for care, um, that there were some positive healthcare experiences, because again, we really, this one, we wanted this to be resilience-based, not a deficit uh, approach. But there were some negative emotions and, and experiences, of course. Um, there were some uh, comorbidity of um, healthcare issues. There were some barriers to accessing healthcare, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, as Danita said, intergenerational experiences, right? That recognition that colonization was at that root cause. Uh, there's kinship support and motivation, and again, that resonated as Danita was speaking. Uh, there's resilience and strengths in the community. 
service there's some service provider um, sub themes and and some uh, CCDAP themes as well. So one of them is this was a, um, a um, quote from the, one of the participants: "A pill isn't going to fix anything, you know." What's, it, what's going to fix it is like the psychiatrist, that's another thing. I'm surprised there's an actual psychiatrist or a psychologist that's reading these surveys and taking the time to understand what it is with us, certain people that live with HIV and different, you know, life-threatening illnesses that we can't maintain our health, that we have problems with maintaining our health. And it's because it's to do with the psychology of it. And you know the things that are going on in their life. If you have no home, how are you going to worry about your health? If you have no food in your cupboard, how are you going to worry about your health? If you have an addiction problem, how do you worry about your health? And so, you know, it, the, the, these are, you know, I have, we have so many, so many amazing things to share, but it's, it's pretty obvious, right? Social determinants of health people, right? Um, another one, for opportunities for self-healing and sharing. I've always told them that, you know, all this stuff that, I've learned to do and learned to speak in front of, you know, 500 people. It didn't just come, it's, but it helped the healing. It really did help the healing, and it did give me a lot of self-encouragement to continue on my path because, you know, I opened up my, myself up to that, and I let go of all those barriers, all that stuff that held me in the pit. Okay, almost done. Um, I'm not going to go through the word cloud, but... Those are, all, those are cool things. They're good visuals. We really wanted some visuals. We don't want our reports back to community to be, you know, a lot of academia kind of stuff. So word clouds are good. Here's some of the barriers, though, um, in terms of accessing health care. You, know, you can hit some of the high notes here. Lack of medical transportation, um, inadequate access to HIV meds, lack of provider expertise, lack of provider interest confidentiality, lack of um, family support, language barriers. Um, but there's also a lot of other great things. Participants have a desire to learn, for example. So we have to find ways to ensure that, um, you know, health, health care services are meeting that. Um, participants identify the best ways to learn about HIV, talking with family members, talking with individuals living with HIV, skill building workshops, etc. We have a lot more that we could say, but we are limited to, to our time constrictions, which we totally understand. Um, so if you are interested in more information, please do let me know. We have, we have a lot more we could share if you're interested. Um, but this has net led to Next Steps, um, which is a $5 million grant from CHR, which obviously I had nothing to do with, just to be very, very clear. <laughs> No conflict of interest here, but All Nations Hope did put in an application with Dr. Dr. Charlotte Lopey, and they were successful, and All Nations Hope is holding the grant. Now talk about capacity building, that is what you want to see. So, very happy. And as a side note, that is the goal of where we're going at IEPH, which I, I didn't have, I had to make a choice of whether to talk about this, which is, way more important than talking about where we're going, but if you've looked at our website lately, IEPH is really, um, you know, going down the path of um, self-determination, and, and that is what needs to happen, and it was, you know, Dr. Jeff Redding and Dr. Malcolm King who created that space so that we could do that now, so that communities can hold grants, and that one day we're going to have, one day soon we're going to have elders being NPIs, and, and that's, you know, just how it needs to be, so... More and more communities are going to be holding grants, and that's how it has to be, and it's how it should be. Um, but so Code Away is the grant that was funded. Its um, translation is Start a Fire. Uh, and, and it really is taking the work, because the work that we wanted to do was asking women, without saying it, how, you know, what would, cult what would a culturally safe care model of care look like, right? We didn't say those words, but that's really what the project was about, and that's what Code Away is. It's, a, it's an intervention. Um, based on digging deep. So we're, um, we're really excited about it. It's about igniting cultural responsiveness through community determined intervention. And so um, it's just pretty incredible. Morningstar Lodge is, is supporting some of the training needs, but we are not named in the grant, not part of the grant. But that's, you know, I think um, All Nations Hope is identifying, look, you know, we're ready to hold grants, but there are still obviously some gaps in terms of capacity building. This is what we need, 
and you know we want you to be part of that. So this is the this is the last slide I'll show. This is uh, the ultimate goal of Codeway is to develop, implement, and assess the impact of land and gender-based cultural interventions that address risk behaviors and context, mental health and trauma, and foster wellness among Indigenous women. And I'm so excited, Miigwech. Thank you so much for that presentation. Thank you, Elder Betty, for your teachings. Thank you, Dr. Barasa, for this wonderful project that you brought to us. And I just love it. Build a fire. I mean, start a fire. Let's go for it. Um, it's my privilege to introduce, and it's an honor to introduce these next two speakers. We have Dr. Alexandra King. She is from the Nipissing First Nation in Ontario. She is the Kamiko, Chair of Indigenous Health and Wellness in the College of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan and Adjunct Professor at SFU's Faculty of Health Sciences. Our second speaker is Sharon Brass. She is a member of the Key First Nations in Saskatchewan. She is, was raised and is living on Coast Salish territories. She is President of the Board of the Talking Stick Festival and she is a multimedia artist, downtown east side warrior for over 30 years. Kui, welcome. So, hi everybody, I'm Alexandra King. Uh, Valerie, thank you um, for the introduction. I'm from Nipissing First Nation and um, my indigenous ancestry is all on my mother's side. Uh, we are a combination of uh, Nipissing as well as Mohawk from Oka First Nation and then Algonquin from Temiskaming First Nation. Uh, my dad was non-indigenous. Uh, I have the pleasure of being a member of the Eagle Clan and I was adopted into the Turtle Clan and um, since I have moved uh, to uh, Coast Salish territory I've had so many dreams and visions of wolves and so I think that uh, there's also some of that. <laughs> yes. um, so I want to start by acknowledging the territory. Uh, uh, Matt, I actually grabbed this from your signature file so thank you. Um, and. Uh, I think it's really important that we're acknowledging territory more and more, uh, but I also think it's important that we don't so, do so so that it becomes unconscious and is just sort of there, you know. And so when I was thinking about uh, Coast Salish territory, I had the pleasure of living here for over six years. I've had the honor and pleasure of uh, being welcomed by each of the host nations at different points in time, of uh, doing ceremony on these territories and so on. Um, I'm part of the Indigenous Wellness Research Group and in fact there's some of them here and so uh, this is a group of researchers who are still doing research here and it's very much culture-based, land-based research and uh, um, so that is ongoing and then uh, I also have an adjunct appointment with Simon Fraser University and in um, my point with Simon Fraser University, I have the real pleasure of working with various people at that institution. Um, so I was uh, working with uh, Dr. Malcolm Steinberg and we designed uh, the first uh, Indigenous component within a required MPH course in the country and it was really nice to be working in partnership with Malcolm. Uh, I also have the thrill of working with Dr. Kelly Lee on um, an antimicrobial resistance uh, project and it's looking at governance of that in the indigenous communities. And uh, then I'm also now about to start working with Paula. And um, it's, you know, when we go to work and so on, this, we spend a lot of our lives with people that we work with. Uh, they can sometimes uh, be as much a part of our lives as even, even our families and so on. And so I was really touched uh, a few weeks ago when I had heard of uh, the passing of Paula's mother and 
um, I asked and the family agreed that I could uh, dedicate this uh, talk tonight in honor of her. And so this is Patricia Gamboa, and um, she passed away suddenly a couple weeks ago. And I was really inspired by her story and what all she did. And so she was an educator and was really a strong activist and uh, a, a social agent of change. And uh, there, there was so much good in her life and what she brought. And I would like us all to be thinking about that and how we can be supporting each other. Um, so one of the reasons why we're here is because of this persistently elevated disease burden of HIV amongst Indigenous people. And I never managed to get these things to work, but I will try. Nope, yet again. Um, so here on the right side, you're seeing the statistics that are published by um, uh, the um, Public Health Agency of Canada, and these are the national HIV surveillance stats. And what you can see is that 21.1% of reported cases in HIV uh, were amongst Indigenous uh, people. We represent just under 5% of the population as, um, you know, we self-identified in the census. On the far side, you see stats for Saskatchewan, and you can see that, um, first of all, the Saskatchewan stats are higher than the rest of the country, but then in particular, you can see the First Nations communities, which are the purple line on the far side, and it is elevated and continues to be. Um, one of the things I thought was interesting is that when they published the surveillance stats, uh, you could write in and ask for the subtable analyses and so on, and so I did so. And I thought it was really interesting that at the national level, uh, there's close to 50% increase of uh, HIV amongst Indigenous people over the last four to five years. And so amongst First Nations males, uh, the stats were showing 9.3% in 2013, and this increased to 13.7% uh, by 2016. Doesn't seem like a lot, but that's uh, a significant amount. Amongst First Nations women, though, the stats are even scarier. 22.9% in 2012, rising to 32.7% uh, by 2016. So um, a lot of times these numbers are buried and you really have to be looking deep. I uh, also want to bring up the fact that uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, one of their calls to action is in fact that there is reporting of statistics. So that allows us to see where are the health inequities and then we can start doing things to be addressing this. And so the fact that we have to write in for special tables and so on I think is a bit problematic. Um, Dr. John Kim, who works at the National Lab in Winnipeg, a really lovely guy, and he's been uh, bringing forward uh, the notion of dried blood spot testing as a way of getting increased screening out there. And they're doing it in all sorts of really, really exciting um, events and uh, in different communities and so on. And he talks about disruptive innovation. And so this is where, in fact, you end up with innovation coming about and it is something that often the status quo, you know, may outperform, let's say, across the board. But for particular groups of people in particular contexts, in fact, these disruptive innovations can serve even better than what you would see in um, a typical mainstream. And so as an example with dried blood spot testing, instead of having to do phlebotomy and drawing a whole vial of blood and then having to process that blood and so on, these are quite simple little pokes that you would do. Stick them on a card, it dries, and then we ship it off in the mail. We actually send it by courier, but nonetheless. Uh, and so this suddenly means that we can be doing this anywhere, powwows, we can be doing it with people who, as Danita was talking about the problems with veins and so on, this happens a lot in, uh, with people who have drug use experience, um, as well as uh, depending on what's going on with a person, you know, the uh, needles can be triggering and so this again is a, a you know, really nice technology. Now one of the things that we thought was interesting is that disruptive innovation is sort of a business kind of term. But they've now brought it into the healthcare setting where they're talking about catalytic innovation. And this is change that is really being driven by civil society, by social needs and so on. And so to me, I think that this is really interesting space to be getting into because we have to start doing game changing things in order to be getting ahead of what's going on with HIV. Um, one of the things that I like about the dry blood spot testing, and I'm not sure, Denise, if you were part of this, but they're training peers. And so this is, are people who are themselves going out and, you know, able to do the testing and connect with people in uh, very uh, um, real and authentic ways, right? Uh, this is a 
thing that uh, is from the CIHR gender uh, module that I had to do when I was uh, getting ready to apply for a grant. And I thought it was really interesting and in fact immediately converted everything on there to wherever it said gender, I put in Indigenous instead. They were talking about reporting. I thought, you know, we're actually talking about all of the health and wellness initiatives. And what I thought was really interesting about this is that they were talking about different levels of, you know, when you are understanding what is going on. And so, you know, from an Indigenous perspective, we start off with Indigenous unequal. And this is where we're doing things that perpetuate uh, Indigenous inequality by privileging um, non-Indigenous over Indigenous, and we see this a lot. We then move into the second level that is talking about Indigenous blind. And so this is where it ignores Indigenous norms, roles, and um, relations based on the misguided principle of being fair to everyone. The next level is where we get into Indigenous sensitive. And so this is where uh, we consider Indigenous norms, roles, and relations, often though, with no remedial action. Uh, next level is uh, <coughs> level four, and that's where we're getting into Indigenous specifics. So at long last, we're actually doing things that are considering Indigenous norms, roles, and relations, and intentionally targeting and benefiting Indigenous people. And it's only at this last level that you get to this Indigenous transformative. And that is when we're considering the Indigenous roles, norms, and uh, relations in a way that addresses the causes of Indigenous-based health inequity and um, includes ways to transform these harmful societal norms. And that's where I think we really need to be getting into it. And it's only when we're at that particular point that we're really going to be transforming what we're doing. I stuck in a medal that's commemorating the Treaty 6 uh, uh, signing, and I thought it was really interesting, because if you listen to Willie Ermin talking about uh, Treaty 6 and this, he brings up the fact that there are two people and they're standing together, they're looking at each other in the eye, they're shaking hands. This is equals coming together. And you know, I think it's really important that as we're thinking about Indigenous health and Indigenous research and so on, that we're doing so in a very good way. Um, another thing that I think is really important is the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action. There are 94 of them. They deliberately called them calls to actions, not recommendation or wish list or something, because they want us to respond. A lot of times you'll see people quoting one in particular or maybe talking about the ones around health or something. But it's really fascinating that as you're going through these, there are so many of them that have applicability to health because, of course, health is everything and there's all things that feed into it. As well, over half of the recommendations deal with reconciliation. And that is within ourselves as Indigenous people, but it's also Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people. The um, calls to action also take and bring in then the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and all that that entail, as well as ILO. Um, C-169, uh, and the reason why that's important is that that actually brings in that free prior and informed consent, and so it's actually a very important covenant. Um, one of the important things in the world of Indigenous health research, and probably in other spaces as well, is this notion of two-eyed seeing. And so this was put forward by um, Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall, and he talks about being able to see through the strengths of one eye with Western ways of knowing and being able to see through the strengths of the other eye with indigenous ways of knowing. And it's when we can bring these two eyes together that we're really starting to see synergistic benefit and so on. Another concept that is sort of related but different is that put forward by Willie Ermine on ethical space. And so what he's talking about there is that when you have these two different worldviews and they're coming together, you need to be creating the space so that we can communicate with each other. You need to be developing a common language, a way of interacting and so on. Uh, Willie calls this space sacred because it is people coming together with very good hearts and wanting to uplift each other and other ways of knowing. Um, it's also where you have to learn to be comfortable with discomfort because you are recognizing that you don't know everything, that there is this other way of knowing that has expertise, and that you're there to learn and do so with great humility. And so I think that the notion of uh, ethical space is really interesting. 
Um, in Saskatchewan, we also have the cultural responsiveness framework, and Carrie mentioned that with the research that they're uh, working on. And this has been endorsed by uh, FSIN and uh, really is something that I think all of us are trying to understand and work towards. The um, Indigenous people in Australia also are using uh, something uh, like this cultural responsiveness. So I think you're seeing this sort of taking off in various parts of the world. And, you know, the way that I see it is that it's going beyond what we have in terms of cultural safety um, in that it is looking really at restoring, you know, Indigenous uh, community-based wellness systems. Oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> establishing a middle ground for engagement between the mainstream and uh, Indigenous systems and worldviews. So there's that ethical space coming in again and transforming mainstream service delivery to become culturally responsive. And so it is a really nice framework, very um, well thought out. Now one of the things that um, I've been having conversations with people like Malcolm King, who's my husband, but um, also people, <laughs> we have conversations about all sorts of things, but, um, and then also people like Willie Ermine uh, and Mason Dury, uh, the uh, Komachua from, uh, Atarua. And, you know, one of the things that we were talking about is if, in fact, you were to be taking and seeing Western ways of knowing and Indigenous ways of knowing. And these are two parallel systems, and you can see that they're equal here. And for those who know about Kiswinta or the Haudenosaunee um, representation of a treaty that was signed between themselves and the Dutch in 1613, they're talking about where there is a recognition that there are going to be European ways that are now part of the North American landscape and that there are indigenous ways and that these two would uh, coexist in parallel, neither one interfering with the other. This is really talking about self-determination and autonomy. And so going back then to this dimensional representation of two-eyed seeing, um, on the bottom here for Western ways, I was thinking about, okay, you know, what is something that maybe isn't really high on Western ways of knowing? And um, let's say it's point of care testing or something. There's actually a lot of technology that goes in behind this, but you know, let's say it's fairly low tech kind of thing. I think we can all recognize that. If instead you go further out on Western ways of knowing, you might have something like, let's say, care for somebody living with HIV who is getting older, and so suddenly now we're dealing with bone metabolism, we're dealing with cardiovascular health, cerebrovascular health, those kinds of things. And so again, I think we can all recognize that it takes a lot more science in doing that. Similarly, on the indigenous scale, we might have things, um, as an example, we learned about doing tobacco ties, you know? And yes, there is so much more depth and complexity in a tobacco tie. But um, by the same token, there's other things such as your Uwipi ceremony or pipe ceremonies and so on that are you know, further out perhaps on the indigenous ways of knowing. And one of the things that Willie was talking about is that he thought that it would be really important where you had these two parallel systems that we would have a way of referring people back and forth between them. And so if people were in the indigenous way of uh, knowing then, you know, let's say that they needed um, x-rays or ultrasounds or they needed surgery and so on, there could be a referral down to the Western way. And vice versa, if they're in the Western way, that again, there's recognition that indigenous ways are useful and, you know, that we could be doing that referral. And when Willie and I were talking, you know, he sort of drew the circle around it and he said, you know, this is really ethical space because there's a recognition between the two systems, that the other exists, that there's expertise in the other. And I thought that was really interesting. Now, the reality is, is that through colonization and colonial processes, we no longer have two equal systems. We no longer have a system where there has been non-interference and where there has been self-determination. And so, in fact, the indigenous ways of knowing, they still exist, we're still using them, but they're not necessarily available to everybody and they don't have the robustness that we would love to see. And so, on the top line, then you're seeing that the indigenous ways of knowing have become much less. 
not that they're lesser, but they have made, been made less through colonization. And you see that there's all these resources that have now been hogged in the Western way. So whether we're talking about the academy or the healthcare system and so on. And so when you think back to Gaswenta versus where we are now and what needs to be restored, I think this is some of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, sorry, you gave me the sign? Okay, so I'm just going to skip over this. There's more of this. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that um, I did want to talk about uh, was just if we were to take and instead of having parallel, we were to throw this into a Cartesian. Um, what you could see then is that you would have um, various initiatives that might just be on the Western axis. You could have things that would only be on the indigenous axis, but you also have a lot of things that would fall somewhere in the middle. And so this could be things like, you know, a healthcare initiative that is um, Western-based but bringing in indigenous ways, or it could be something like building bridges, where, you know, this is an epidemiological study that then is bringing in indigenous ways of understanding and asking questions and doing the analysis and so on, right? So. Um, and one of the things, though, that we, we were talking about is that if, in fact, you were to be Western and then be bringing it up towards Indigenous, the first line um, would be something along the lines of cultural competency. And this is not the way that I think we have originally implemented it, but uh, Maori colleagues are revisiting it and they're recognizing that cultural competency is not only competency in another's culture, but it's also competency in one's own. And that, in fact, you have to become competent in your biases and the lens that you are bringing and the unintended actions that you might be, you know, um, imposing on other people. And they also go on to say that they don't think competency is enough, but they think of cultural fluency. And so, you know, they bring forward that they have Maori, uh, non-Maori researchers and physicians who are learning Maori so that they can communicate in a more effective manner. We do have people like that here in Canada, you know. Next line is cultural safety. And again, this isn't the one, you know, an individual going off and doing an online course or something. This is at the institutional level. We are talking about policies and processes that take and create an unsafe environment. And so even as a healthcare practitioner, even if I am doing my best to be culturally safe in the care that I'm providing, if I'm sitting inside a big hospital or you know some of these other establishments, those are unsafe environments. And so recognizing that. And then further up, you're getting into cultural responsiveness. Now, um, sorry, Sharon, this is where I'm throwing it, tossing the ball over to you. So in our team, um, we have brought together people with lived experience. We have community researchers. We have elders, uh, as well as an academically trained researchers. And I sort of envision this almost like a braid where you have these different strands that you're weaving together. And so we have ancestral ways of knowing. We have wisdom that comes from lived experience. And then you have Western ways. And so we're sort of, you know, as we're going about our work and so on, we're all committed to this. And then we realize that, in fact, there was still more work to do. And this is actually getting at the, you know, institutional, if you will, or collective cultural safety and self-reflexivity. And so um, Elder Sharon Jinkerson Brass, who we have the thrill of working with, as well as Terry Howard, who is our research manager, came up with um, what they thought we needed to do as a team to become much more culturally safe and be what it is that we should be. So we're kind of a motley crew with big hearts here. <laughs> what we decided to do, I, I, I'm Anishinaabe Kwe and Ukrainian, and I realize I'm in West Coast apparel, but that's because my partner was an artist and carver who's now in the spirit world, and he designed this for me, and I feel his spirit with me when I speak. So, not to confuse everybody, since we're talking about mm -hmm. cultural nuances and competencies. I am here, though, to talk about, we came up with a concept for an Indian policy manual. Mm -hmm. And Alexandra hasn't seen it. And we have had the latitude in this process 
to be creative, innovative, to take some risks, to try and build that warm fire for future generations. Because it's very hard in this environment. We talked a lot about lateral violence. And we, as a team, have really come together to make it okay to fall. And we pick each other up, but also to take some risks culturally. So Alexandra has not seen this, and I realize. But here is our policy manual. And Kahindi and Bernice, two of our team members, are going to hold it up. And I'll share, you, share a little bit about what went behind it. Be gentle. I realize the wooden paddles are. So here's our policy manual. And we did a team retreat recently. And we collaborated on this together to decide what values and what would hold us together as a group. Alexandra, can you see? Mm -hmm. So here at the top, the flowers represent seven generations behind us and seven generations ahead of us. The black space in the middle is the space between this world and the spirit world, that place in between where our, our minds receive creation. Then we have four um, cylinders with wolf hair because wolf are pack animals. They're also patriarch or matriarchal and we were inspired to honor wolf medicine with this um, in the apron. There's the tree of life and this motif was gifted to me about 30 years ago, Elder Marge White and Gloria Nicholson gifted me with this motif and I've innovated it a bit in that at the top, it's a tree of life, the sacred tree of life, and at the top, there's a Y. And when my people rain dance, the tree has a Y and the dancers are focused on the dark and the light side of life. So we have that, the dark and the light. Then we have the paddles going down and Matt, another team member, is going to read off the list of the paddles. And at the bottom, another innovation, it usually just has two circles at the bottom for male and female. And we, I put a third one in the center for our two-spirited brothers and sisters to honor them the deep root. And the shells are just there, and we just don't know why yet. But when we figure it out, we'll let you know. So, and this is our policy manual. We're going to do more ceremonies with it. It will have songs and dances. And we will memorize our list that we've created so that it is something that lives inside of us, as opposed to a book that sits on a shelf that sort of is the rules. This is something that we will dream with and will inform us. And we might change up some of the paddles eventually, but we will, it will have a song, it will have a dance, and we'll figure that part out as we get to that space. So, Matt? At the top of each paddle, you'll see there are some colored beads. Uh, the yellow ones represent our values. Some of those will include love, humility, um, vision, generosity, humor. The red beads uh, refer to our operational, and with that we have transparency, com commitment, dedication, <coughs> and confidentiality. The dark blue beads, the paddles there, are representative of tobacco, land acknowledgement. These are our protocols, sir. Uh, teachings, ceremony. Uh, the green beads represent etiquette, and with that we have wisdom, generosity, inclusiveness, uh, listening, holding space. The pale blue represents community. Some of those are covered with uh, reconciliation, the seven generations, knowledge holders, capacity strengthening. The black is representative of sovereignty, and with that we have self-care and counsel. And the top one, this is, this is, 
blank and it's for everybody to determine but for me that represents the creator yeah thank you There was, I'm just going to say one last thing. There's one last slide that you didn't get to see, and that was for CAR, which is the Canadian Association for HIV Research. We are having the annual meeting in Saskatoon. Uh, it's okay. Uh, and uh, that is May uh, 9th through uh, 12th. And so we're really excited about it and hoping that all of you will come to Saskatoon to see this fantastic place where all sorts of exciting things are happening. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. King, Sharon Brass, and the whole team that was up here. Amazing presentation. Um, thank you. Um, I love the book that doesn't sit on a shelf. Uh, now I'd like to invite all the speakers up to the front to begin our question period. We only have a short time for questions, so I'd like to ask Danita, Carrie, Elder Betty, and Alexandra to come join us up here. Come on, Danita. No, I'm good for standing. What do you want? I don't understand. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you want the, this? Oh, I'm going to run. I love that idea. Sure. Are there any questions from the audience before I have to come up with my own? Oh, come on. Okay, I'm going to let you think for a minute. Danita, I'm going to start with you. I really honor your story tonight, um, to witness your resilience, and you have truly broken the cycle. I, I really honor for that, and you're working in community, and you're mentoring. Can you give us your aha moment when you decided to break that and make that change? Is there an aha moment? Um, I really, really decided that um, I really wanted my son home. Um, it was so heartbreaking for him to be away from me for that long of a period. Um, I really wanted him home and I did everything I could to get him home. And that I really changed my life for him. And um, that's how much a mother's love for their ch children. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, is there any questions from the audience? Please. Okay, you got one more minute to think. Uh -huh. <laughs> Elder Betty, can I ask you, um, you talked about a health bundle. Can you tell us a little bit about what was maybe in the health bundle or what it was? If I can ask that question. Sure. It's, uh, we house it at the lab and we took it into and created it in the sweat lodge and it's a bear sweat lodge because I'm from the bear clan and it has the four sacreds in it but it also has prayer that we take into ceremony every month and we also have placed in it uh, other sacred uh, things uh, that we have uh, uh, shells that are in there like, uh, and we have rocks uh, and it's wrapped in four different colors for the for the communities that we go to, and how they, those colors symbolize the different uh, nations as well, and the different uh, seasons. And we also have it in a baby's bundle, so it's it's in a tignoggin, if you know what a tignoggin is. I think they say it in English. Does anybody know the English word for tignoggin? Like a, so that you would carry a baby in, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. On your back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah a moss so, bag. Yeah. No, it's not a moss bag. No. No. A tick noggin is made of wood. No, but it's not a moss bag, but it's similar. A cradle board. A cradle board. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's yeah. it. Cradle board. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, Thank you for sharing that teaching. 
Thank you, Harlan. <laughs> I was waiting, Harlan. I was too. And actually, if you, I was going to volunteer you, and, and next was Rodney, wherever you are. Oh. Once again, thank you so much. This is amazing and so incredibly inspiring. Um, what I would like to, to just, uh, Elder Betty, as well as other panelists, is I thought that it was incredibly innovative in which that you rooted and grounded in ceremony, and you began with ceremony. And I know that we work with an indigenous team, and I know that there is much money within organizations for increasing capacity, leadership development, <laughs> coaching. And I've never thought about, like, how is it that we actually, as an indigenous community, how can we create spaces in which that we can go into ceremony, go to fast, go to Sundance, and go as a team and be supported by a broader organization? I would love to hear how that worked and how that happened. Well, from my teaching, when you go to ceremony, that's where your ancestors are. That's where the grandfathers and grandmothers come and they surround you. And they give you that strength. They give you that resilience to be able to do the work that we we're living in a world that they didn't live in. And they know our struggles. They know what we need and they take care of those needs. So as long as we continue to ground ourselves in ceremony, they're there to help us. And they're really there. They, they come in and they light up the place to let you know that they're, they're there with you. So. Yeah. And if, like, functionally, if I can tell you how we do it, how we functionally do it, I mean, she does it. She does the work. <laughs> she does the hard work. Um, but for us to functionally do it, like, so I think you mean, I think part of your question, part of your question, she answered most of it, but part of your question is, like, how do you pay for it, right? Like, how do you actually say, okay, we're going to do this ceremony and we're going to pay the staff to go to ceremony, right? Which is what we do in our lab. Like, we pay our staff if they want to go, they get paid for that time to go. Plus, it takes money and money to actually put ceremony on, right? We can't ask her to do this for free. It's, that would be completely wrong and against it, all of our teachings, right? So how do we do this? Well, we pay for it out of, I, I mean, all of, all of our money is soft money, right? Um, so we have had to have conversations with our funders to say, uh, this is training. This is training just as much as it's training if I sent somebody to the University of Saskatchewan to, to go and do SPSS training. And, he, and now it has been a battle, but, we're, but we've, what we've gotten there. And you have to carve it out in, in basically when you're putting your budget in, right, to say, this is training. It's training and we need it and this is how many times we're and, and so even for elder honorarium we've had to we've had to like bump the honorarium up like this hundred and fifty dollar stuff does not work and no nickel and diming and saying that oh well if if the elders only doing something for two hours then it's only this much no it's this much this is what we need and also making an elder position in your organization rather than, oh, we're only going to have an elder, you know, this, this time or once a month or creating a position because that way um, then that, that per whoever you have it coming in as the elder, then you, you have the money allocated and then you can itemize your budget for um, tobacco and, you know, and then that way the ceremony um, is itemized out of different budget lines, right? But, but it's doable, you have to be a little creative, um, but creative accounting is, you can get there, right? Um, I'm not saying you do anything illegal, I'm just saying be creative. But when you, when you split it up through different budget lines, right, then, then you're able to, you know, basically pay for the ceremonies and, and um, particularly trainings, right? So you're gonna do, you're gonna do t tobacco tie training, right? And you explain it and it, seems reasonable. A lot of, a lot of organizations now are, are coming around to understanding, particularly in the era of the TRC, and you use the TRC to your advantage, right? The TRC is saying it. It's, it's literally supporting us right there. And so we've been able to really, you know, get a lot of traction with that. And push back. Like, I've had a couple of, of funders say, oh, no, we can't possibly do that. And I get on the phone and I say, we are in an era of the TRC. And I like really use my voice. 
I really use it, right? And, and I don't give up. And I get back and I go back and I go back and I go back until they don't want to hear my voice anymore. <laughs> and, and I mean, so it's, that, it's part of that and it's part of being a bit creative, um, but it can, you can do it. I'm sorry, okay. can I just add? Yep. Uh, so we um, and this research team um, have been doing culture-based and land-based research. And by this, we're, as a team, we will do ceremony, but we're also, our research project is providing ceremony to the participants. And, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about, uh, yeah, if, when we first started talking about how would we go about doing research, uh, some of our peer researchers were absolutely clear that doing an interview where you bring somebody into a dark place, you're asking them to tell their story and so on, this is not a good thing. You're leaving them open and, you know, it, it, it's not good for them. And so we took, and as we're designing our research process, we're um, undertaking ceremony with the participants, we're providing them with teaching, we're um, approaching this in a very gentle way. And um, then, you know, even in the design of the questions, we're thinking about what does this, what are you actually asking the people and where is it that you would be asking them to go? And again, then thinking about strengths-based and so on. And so, uh, like Bernice has been the lead on this fabulous project that we're just in the process of wrapping up. I've been working with Willie Ermine and Norman Rabbitskin on another project where, you know, the participants are doing land-based healing intermixed with the actual research. And I think that this is where some of things need to go. People are very interested in learning about this and particularly in our community where there's been so much disruption and disconnection, so. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I have a question for Dr. King and my question is, what do you think of your new policy manual? <laughs> um, I, I personally really love it. Um, and I hold up my hands to Sharon and uh, the work that the team did because we got together and talked about every word that was going to be on every paddle. And... Um, you know, one of the things that Matt brought up is, you know, maybe what we should be doing is making a duplicate set of these paddles. And so you could draw one and wear it and be thinking about what does that paddle mean? And if, let's say, Deneen and I were to run into each other, maybe we could trade paddles and, you know, so on and talk about that. It could be a way of starting our day together and whatnot. And so I think when you're looking at the ethics of research and bringing in indigenous ethics and values, this has to be something living and it has to be very real and concrete. Thank you so much. And that was actually my question to you. Um, so you've answered it. And it was like, how do you see indigenous peers and indigenous researchers and elders and allies all working together? And you've answered that so eloquently. And um, Carrie, the toolkit you were developing, is it available to community yet? Or how do we get to read this um, is another question. And then I have one final question for the whole panel. Uh, the, the toolkit isn't finished yet, but it will be available to communities and um, yeah, it, for, for anybody as soon as it's finished, but it's not, it's not quite finished yet. yet. Harlan, I have one before you, and then it's time. <laughs> I'm getting the, t they're, they're doing this to me now. Um, and it's just, I guess what I want to say is it's so necessary um, we sent in for ethic approval and we got denied because we were offering tobacco ties. We sent it back with the teachings from the elders and we were denied because tobacco is bad for you. And this is so, and when you're talking about Western and Indigenous two-way street, it's still a very bumpy road. And um, Harlan, I'm going to cut mine short so you get that last question, only if it's quick. It's totally quick. And then I, have to be I just want to, like, uh, again, uh, uh, my relative. Uh, thank you so much um, for your bravery, your story, and also holding space for our Two-Spirit relatives and for your policy manual and including the, our Two-Spirit people. In this conversation around HIV and AIDS, prevention, care, and treatment must include our Two-Spirit relatives. And for that space and the work, both for Carrie and the elders, 
and uh, Dr. King, all of your work in holding space for our Two-Spirit relatives to ensure that we are front and center and included within this work, to call us home and to mend that healing, that circle to our rightful place where we stand abreast and can look at each other in the eyes with pride and with love. So I just thank you so much. At this time, I'd like to thank all our speakers. I'd also like to acknowledge our elders past, present, and emerging. I'd also like us to take the time to remember those that have gone on before us, and remember all of those that are still living with HIV, and all those who are affected by HIV. Remember the children that we've lost, the children that were born with HIV. There are true long-term survivors. And one day, I would love to say, I used to have HIV. At this time, I would like to invite up to the stage Elder Roberta Price, our Coast Salish Elder, who will close the event for this evening. Elder Roberta. Elder Betty that I carry this beautiful uh, sacred medicines that she offered to me when we came together in Ontario to sit as elders in advisory to Dr. Barassa in the work she does and, and I want to share that um, I want to hold my hands up to you uh, hi Danita for for sharing your for the strength and the power that you share within your own life and you know, the strength of your, your survival for all your nine grandkids. Mm -hmm. I, I only have eight. <laughs> <laughs> so they keep us alive, they keep us alive and well. So I just want to share uh, some teachings. I had the blessing and the grace to have worked with close to 30 elders in my journey. And um, I want to honor uh, the teachings of one of my strong, strong, loving mentor elders, Elder Vince Stoven. And I'm wondering if somehow, or maybe we could just do it in the rows because there's no space on the side. But uh, Elder Vince's teachings and many other elders that whenever we come together, we must share a blessing and a prayer. And what that blessing and the prayer, what it does, it covers our thoughts, it covers our words, it covers our interactions together. In that blessing and the prayer, what we do, Elder Vince's teachings are that we join hands. And when we join those hands, what we do is we put our left palm up to our person on our left. That left palm up is to Father Sky. We put our right palm down to our person on our right. That right palm down is to Mother Earth. Elder Vince's other teachings are that our left palm up is to our ancestors. We're calling upon and calling down and the prayers to be amongst us. very very strong so come as you are how you are how you feel comfortable where you stand and we'll say a blessing and a prayer for our time together I want to share I was pretty confused when I met my elders sometimes didn't know my right from my left <laughs> so our left palm is up and our right palm is down and I'll say a blessing and a prayer we're giving you many, many thanks, Creator, for bringing us together in such a good, warm, and respectful way. We ask, Creator, that you bless the ones who weren't able to be here due to illness or other obligations. We ask, Creator, that you continue to bless our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our spirits. So when we're thinking our thoughts, they are good, positive, and respectful. When we're speaking our words, they are good, positive, and respectful. We call upon you, Creator, to bless the people who have prepared that food. Bless the food and drink and medication to be put into our bodies on our journeys to wellness and strength. We give you many, many thanks, Creator, for blessing all the shared teachings, all the shared learnings, all the shared interactions that have gone in our special event tonight. We kindly and respectfully ask you, Creator, to cover us each with your warm blanket of protection 
as we journey, some of us in our educational lives, our professional lives, our family lives, and our lives in general. We always give you many, many thanks, Creator, as we ask you to bring all of your blessings down upon the hurting, the hungry, and the homeless, and especially the hurting Creator. Haitka, Haitka Osian, Osian. And may we all have safe travels home to all our dear loved ones. Haitka, Haitka, everyone. Thank you, everyone.